All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Developer Commentary. I'm Mike Stout, and I'm here with my special guest, Teal Bald. Say hi, Teal. Hi. I'm <laughs> someone half of you hate. Hi. How you doing? Uh, maybe we should talk about that a little bit. You've been getting a little hate in the comments. Yeah, that's. I'm fine. I'm used to it. Is it's not making you cry? No, no, I'm good. I, I've, I've been bullied for years. I'm fine. All right. <laughs> You know, uh, I would like to ask, you know, normally our our viewers are a lot nicer than that. So I, I, I just want to say, guys, Tony and I, we did we did 200 plus episodes. We've known each other for 16 years. We've we had some practice, right? It's going to take Teal and me a couple episodes to get that down. So uh, Tony will be coming back. It's not like he's going to be gone forever. So... Just sit back and enjoy. We're going to actually have some videos out instead of needing to wait another year. Yeah. Can I just say, this looks gorgeous. Oh, I love this level, man. This is one of the mm. best looking. I believe that the art was done by Craig Goodman, and he does a lot of my favorite looking levels. Mm. Uh, it, man. it has... Um, I can't remember what the level's called. The, um, the level... Oh, where you first use the uh, Furminator in Ratchet 2. It looks a lot like that. Um, oh, yeah. In terms of city uh i think that was planet barlow yeah yes uh bar is it uh, possibly i can't remember specifically but which path would you like me to take right or left uh left let's go left left okay the original path of death <laughs> the uh in this one uh this is where the original hoverboard race glitch was where you could get all the bolts Yes. So I can point out where that is in case anyone wants to try it in the original American PS2 version. Uh, okay. I'll let you know when we get to the room where it is. Cool. Oh, oh the God. hydro displacer, man. Yep. This, uh, I, I liked the hydro displacer, but it got a lot of hate after it came out. Really? Yeah, like, uh, I'm not exactly sure what it was, but uh, we got slammed for it in some of the reviews. I guess because it takes a little bit of time, you have to backtrack a little, but I don't mind. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, that's that's how puzzles are usually. Yeah. That, the Water Temple, have you played that? <laughs> you know, that maybe that's why. Maybe people are so used to hating water levels. Yeah, that that is a key hatred amongst that and ice levels, which I, I seem to really enjoy water and ice levels, as long as they're not too unfair to the point where it's just tedious. But Yeah. Well, the, I think one of the biggest problems with the, the water temple in Zelda was that uh, you kept having to go into the menu, and it was kind of a long trek. Mm, in, the yeah. G, in the GBA version, you don't have to do that because it's on the lower screen. So I've heard yeah, that that's... The 3DS version. Sorry, 3DS, yeah. yeah. Uh, I've heard that that's actually the best version to play because of that. Mm. Yeah, it also has Master Quest um, built in. Once you beat the game, you unlock Master Quest. Oh, nice. Yeah, I, I remember the Master Quest. I got that as a bonus GameCube disc, I think. Yeah, was, was it with Wind Waker? I think it was, yeah, like if you pre-ordered from... Okay, so at the bottom of this one is where the, the room is. Really? So this is this, this is, is the how room. you originally broke it? So what did you have to do? So on the that the left side of that door... Right. There's, there's a little mound on the floor, uh, like in the corner of the room. I can't really uh, see on the video, but if you, stand, if you pull out the taunter and stand on it, Ratchet will point the taunter straight up. Really? Yeah, because oh, when... Oh, that. Yeah, and then when you use it, and and it's still broken, which it, it shouldn't be in the HD version. Yeah. Uh, the hoverboard race happens to be right above you, and the taunter... <laughs> so the taunter will keep breaking the crates, and they'll keep respawning infinitely. So, oh, fantastic. Wait, hello. Did it work? I got bolts. I got bolts for a second. Oh, so maybe, maybe it's still in there. Maybe it was just from upstairs somewhere else i don't know could have been from through inside the door but but that's where it is and so if anyone wants to try it and see it in a video i don't know if anyone's found that that bug before that's really cool but we uh as far as i know we fixed it and then uh people found the much more complicated way of doing it well there was a really easy way of just using the um i can't remember what the devices but it just ch it changed you into a robot just go into oh. that and talk to the lady and that's it yeah, that was the uh, infiltrator. Was it called? No, the oh, I can't remember. 
can't Hollow guys. Name. The Hollow guys. Yes, Hollow guys. We used to break everything with that gadget, man. The ho <laughs> between the Hollow guys and the Visibomb, we found hundreds and hundreds of like. Anytime we got bored and needed to find a bug, we'd bust those things out and just try to break something. Fair enough. You know, because the the, the Hollow guys and the Visibomb both put you into what we call a, a special hero state. Uh, mm. And that, whenever you go into a special hero state, there's always a frame or two where you could fuck something up just by hitting a bunch of random buttons or sitting <laughs> on the controller or something. So, uh, my my buddy Super Greg and I, I don't know if I... Do you know if I ever talked about him in the... In the I don't know. He was one of our producers at Sony, but on this game, he and I were both testers. Right. So he'd come in and we'd stay up for, you know... Uh, 16 hour days and nights just playing this game together. So we got real close and and now I think he's the uh, If not the executive ratchet producer at least the line producer for it. Oh cool. Yeah I, I want to ask before we talk to that guy whose idea was um, that uh, Section because for me every decent game must have a secret behind a waterfall and a section where you have <laughs> where a, a, something rising is chasing you and I love that section, and in Pokotaro, I believe there was a secret behind a waterfall. So this game is perfect, basically. You know, what I, I'm trying to say. I've never said it before, but I agree with that. As long as there's a secret behind a waterfall, I'm always happy. Yeah. Like, but uh, the all of the hydro displacer segments were done by Mark Cerny. Oh, okay. Yeah, he that the the gadget and each segment, except for a few secrets in some of the levels, uh, he designed those on paper, uh, you know, graph paper. Oh, really? And because that was the way uh, before, before the PlayStation Two era, we would do all of our designs on graph paper, and they actually measured the levels by how many physical pages of graph paper you used. So, the artist would say, "All right, this can't be more than five pages, or it's going to be too big for us to do." <laughs> but then, once we got on this game, we were able to cheat and do things with scaling, so they couldn't use pages anymore. Right. Uh. Oh, I love this guy talking. He talks about how he makes five bolts an hour, and I'm like, why don't you just walk ten feet and yeah. pick up the bolts off the floor? What's wrong with you? You mean you and your walking camera? You paparazzi make me sick. Now beat it. But sir, paparazzi. He does look like a walking camera, though. That's true. <laughs> Underpants. Oh, we get, well, you know we actually get to see him in his underpants in, in the third game. I didn't realize that was uh, foreshadowing. That is true. Yeah. In advance. Oh, that's bolts. Oh, in this game, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. I. Oh man, it, we were brutal about taking bolts from you in this game. Uh. And uh, probably the the one that I thought was the worst was uh, in Ratchet 2, though, when you talk to the crab. It's like yeah. 40,000 or something. Something like that, yeah. Oh, man. The, the world that makes me cry. Oh, Captain Quark. You're so evil. <laughs> he comes across as a psychopath, you know, because... Uh, like, we, we really wanted to make it a surprise when Captain mm. Quark was the bad guy. But I think the way we ended up doing it made him seem a lot meaner than we really wanted him to, especially given how cool of a character he is, you know? Mm. But in Ratchet 2, he's really, like, evil. <laughs> really. That was, that was sort of a result of how he came across in this one. And I think, yeah. I think when we redeemed him starting in Ratchet 3, he was a much better character, which is probably why in the PS3 games he's he's much more of a hero, or at least just an idiot, right? Not a psychopath. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with Ratchet 2, I never saw it coming. I, oh, the proto-pet uh, it, being Captain Quark? <laughs> yeah, I, it never... I, mean, I was just like, oh, it sounds similar, but... Like, even then I was like, I know they use multiple voice actors throughout series, so it's just like, it's probably just the same voice actor. Oh, okay, that I didn't see coming. Dude, those are actually the maps uh, that they were just showing there, those blueprints. Those were actually illustrator maps that we would use. That's oh, cool. cool. Yeah. So I, I'd never realized that. Uh, when I was making this game, I wasn't doing design yet. I was doing some junior design stuff, like crate placement. Oh, God. Oh. Or... <laughs> 
or minor segments, which we still haven't talked. Actually, that might be a good thing for us to talk about in one of these uh, episodes. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I would place things that uh, uh, the designers didn't have time to place, and it helped me sort of learn the tools. But mostly I was just testing. Right. We would do uh, shadow volumes. That was one of ours. Uh, oh, man, the animators hated us because we were responsible for optimizing the, the animations. Mm -hmm. And uh, that meant basically making them not look as good. <laughs> so they, they were constantly coming up going like, did you have to take that frame out of the animation? <laughs> oh, oh wow. We're already done with one of the segments, huh? Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to mention, like, I don't know if you'll know why, but why... I, I guess it's because they couldn't, but why didn't they make, like, two alternate cutscenes? Because in uh, both the hoverbike, uh, the hoverboard racing and the court cutscene, um, one of them is either inconsistent. It's like, can we go hoverboarding now? Or, I've never seen these people before. It's like, it yeah. just like... Like, it, why <laughs> why didn't they make two cutscenes? Was it impossible, or...? My, the way I remember it, I, I'm pretty sure that we as the testers pointed that out to them. Uh, but we, when when the videos went in, it was really late, right? Like, right, uh, I see. It was probably beta or for some of the cutscenes alpha. So by the time we were able to find those inconsistencies, it was just too late to record new VO and to have the animators make a new scene. Uh, and that happened a lot, especially back in these games before we had someone who was, you know, a full-time writer slash VO person. Uh, mm. In this game, it meant that two of our animators would be gone, uh, you know, uh, directing VO. And so, you know, since they were the ones who would also have to animate the cutscenes, it was a huge problem if we had to redo it. Right. Fair enough. Oh! Oh, nice. No, I'm, I'm alive, don't I? I'm good. It's so good. <laughs> ledge grab counts, ledge grab counts. I'm fine. Is this the, uh, is this level the first appearance of the Sharkigator? Uh, yes. Oh, uh, ladies. Yes, it is. There ladies it is. and gentlemen, first appearance of the Sharkigator. It's beautiful. I would shoot it with my Visibomb glove, but I fear it would do nothing, and also <laughs> I don't have it. <laughs> oh, the, the Sharkigator, man. He... He, uh, I got a, a letter from somebody saying that uh, he was like their favorite thing in uh, in these old games. And he was sad that we never said what its name was or what its backstory was. And the truth was we never had a name for it or a backstory for it uh, yeah. officially, you know, because we didn't think anybody cared. We just thought, oh, he's that stupid fish we keep reusing in every game. Mm. Uh, so it was kind of something that pointed out to me how... Even the smallest, most, the decisions that we hate, you know, end up being something special to somebody that they remember for their whole life. It's really weird, you know? Well, it's also in Jack and Daxter. The Sharkigator is? Yeah, it's in uh, Sandover Beach. <laughs> uh, so, presumably, because, did Mark Cerny work on both? Uh, I think so. Uh, I think yeah, he worked so on both. That's yeah. presumably why. Oh, so maybe I, we... I know I know Naughty Dog and Insomniac have had a very close relationship since forever. So yeah, That's... we we shared tech, uh, not as much as everybody thought, but uh, you know the the two companies we'd have parties together, you know, uh, and we had kind of a friendly competitive relationship where mm. each of us we would want our games to do better of course but we were always nice to each other and we wanted to put references to each other and a lot of us at the the studios we played each other's games so uh it was really it, it was close but not as close as a lot of people make it out right i think the only tech we shared was uh they had some really ingenious rendering code that uh uh, I think made everything look just great. And we didn't have it in our first... Remember when, when I talked about the Metropolis diorama? Mm. Uh, we didn't have the, the technology then. We couldn't necessarily do the views we were trying to promise. Right. Uh, so, so getting that in was really helpful. And then uh, what we gave them back was we took uh, a lot of the features in our engine that they didn't have, like the... Uh, occlusion system and a few other optimizations and we gave it back to them so that they could use it in their games 
So it was a lot more back and forth than the press knew about. Right. The, um, uh, if I, I can't remember, I don't know how much of this is true, but if I remember correctly, um, talking about render systems, um, Naughty Dog, when they released Crash 2, they had, like, the amount of, they found a way of exceeding the polygon count by, like, four times what, um, the PS1 was originally wow. capable of or something. Um, if I remember correctly. So, they I'm going to assume, uh, the greater model of that for the PS2, basically. Yeah, it was that, and they, they had a really cool model of, uh, so, uh, it was streaming, streaming data was another thing that they did really elegantly, uh, so that we could have levels that were, that we didn't need to load every five seconds. Like, if you remember the early PlayStation 2 and PlayStation 1 days, uh, mm. there were loads all over the place. Yeah. And that was because, uh, rather than working on a cartridge, which everyone had been used to up until then, we were working on the disc. And uh, because of physics, when the disc is spinning, everything on the inside of the disc you can access faster than everything on the outside. So there's a, a hard physics limit to how, mu how fast you can load stuff. So what they came up with was this idea that you could load in stuff in the future and unload stuff that's in your past uh, as long as you kept enough distance between them so that uh, people wouldn't have to wait while you were inside a single level. And uh, the, way they, the way they masked it in Jack 1 and, and to a certain extent in Jack 2 was, you know those rooms where you're in and it's like an airlock and it closes yeah. for 10 seconds and then opens again? That's a load. Yeah. They're just yeah. they're just masking it well, by letting Jack, you run Jack around. Jack one didn't have anything. Jack two is Jack one is just like well, I guess it's um I guess uh, to get to Misty Island you have to go on the boat, but more or less it's just the entire world is just there, like whatever you whatever you see you can go to and it's amazing. Yeah, that was their bit. That was one of their biggest technological achievements and one of the things we were able to benefit from. But <laughs> um, their one of the downsides of it was that their genius programmer, uh, I forget, I think it might, he might be named Andy Gavin. Uh, he's like a super genius on the level of Al, you know, how we've always been talking right. about how crazy smart he is. Well, he programmed in a programming language that almost nobody else at Naughty Dog understood. And it, it was really uh ingenious because using that language meant that they could do things that they couldn't do if they were programming in C. But it also meant that anytime anyone else had to fix a bug, they might not know how to do it if they didn't know that language. Uh, the language was LISP, which stands for, in my opinion, lots of irritating silly parentheses. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so hard to read. I'll put a, an example of it up on the screen. But it's just, like, it's parentheses all over the place, and, and you have no idea what's going on. So one of the services we did when we gave the code back to Naughty Dog was we converted all of that crazy Lisp code into C code so that their programmers and our programmers would much easier be able to use it. Uh, before I talk to the Rhino guy, um, correct me if I'm wrong, the tests, some of the, some or maybe all, uh, the tests came out with all the skill points, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, we had a test yeah. plan. I, actually, I should talk about that afterwards. Because there's a skill point where once you have the O2 mask, you put it on here, and it's not automatically um, uh, put on you. It's only on plants which is needed. So right. you have to manually put it on and turn that into a chicken. Whoever came up with that idea is a genius. I love that skill point. <laughs> you know, that might have been my idea, but it also might have been Brian Algeyer. Uh Right. Well, I, both of you are geniuses anyway. So yeah. the, the testers came up with some of the skill points and some of the secret locations because we were, you know, playing it so much we knew how to break it. Right. And so either when we broke something, we would either decide, oh, that's a feature and we'd keep mm. it or, oh, that's a, you know, that's a bug. We got to get rid of that. And in the yeah. case of a lot of skill points and uh, secrets, it would be, nah, that's a feature. We're going to keep that. I, I will say I love this. Which Great idea. The, the drains. <laughs> oh, Great idea yeah. Of platforms. I think that this uh, this level, except for the hoverboard and the uh, that sewer segment, was designed by Brian Algar, mm. uh, and he's now the uh, he's the creative director on all the Ratchet games, and he has been since before the title of creative director was invented. So Algar 
is the constant thread throughout all of these Ratchet and Clank games. He's worked on all of them. I love him. Even Nexus, you know, and I, he's working on the new one. So it, it's cool. uh, it's really neat that there's this this thread that that runs through all of the Ratchet games. Oh, that's a lot of money. That's a <laughs> lot, that's an amount of money you cannot get in one playthrough. <laughs> no, no, that we make is sure not you possible. Can. Yeah, well, that was... that's thanks for that. <laughs> that's that's there to taunt and destroy my soul. <laughs> By design, you know, we. Uh, uh, we wanted to make sure that there were things that after you beat the game, you could still go back and play. Well, the Rhino in this game is phenomenal. <laughs> oh, yeah. It really is. It's one of my favorites. It's. I, I love it, too. Nine rockets. <laughs> and they go one everywhere. Ammo. <laughs> they just go everywhere. Like They really do. Later Rhinos, you have to aim them. This Rhino, you just fire and it's like fire to, and everything dies <laughs> and every missile is to whom it may concern it's it's my, awesome <laughs> <laughs> my fa my favorite is uh the rhino free um because it's literally a ball of plasma which turns everything to ash and i like seeing things turn to ash it's a very nice effect Th that was uh uh i think the the programmer who did that was keith davis and he was an effects genius like uh besides i think maybe eric christensen he did the best uh, special effects in the whole game, and he was a programmer. Uh, like programmers did all of our special effects in these games, so often it meant, you know, that uh, you had to be a programmer with a very strong artistic sense. And we didn't necessarily hire programmers for their art skills, you know. So yeah. uh, it was really amazing the stuff that they were able to do in the later games. Like, it, you know, in this game, when you throw the bomb in the bomb glove, uh, maybe, yeah, you, there we go. It's, uh, the effect is two transparent spheres inside of each other. Oh. And we called that a shell. And it's it's something that, we, that was used a lot on PlayStation 1 because it's super efficient, right? The sphere only has about 12 faces, maybe 20 if you're really crazy. So you could draw a lot of those and make stuff that looked good. Uh, in later games, we would never use shells by themselves because it looked too last gen. We would always combine them with, uh, you know, a bunch of other particles or, or uh, you know, uh, screen effects or things like that. So the effects in this game are basic, but they still look really good, I think. Mm. Oh, no, I, th I think they look great. I love the Tesla coil. Yeah, that was, that was uh, the same guy who does the camera, uh, Roberto. Oh, excellent. He he did that and the uh, Morph Array, you know, the little double helix uh, yes. effect. And uh, I think a few of the other weapons, too. Uh, maybe it, between uh, Peter Hastings and Roberto, they were most of the weapon effects, I think. I see. Uh, oh, uh, the test plan. We mentioned that earlier. I, I was going to mm. talk about that. Yeah. Uh, when you're testing a game... Uh, Often what you do is, there, there's two types of testing. One we call ad hoc, which is, uh, you know, you just play the game and try to break it. And that's mm -hmm. the most fun way to test, right? Because it, it has some creativity involved. You have to start thinking about ways that you could cause glitches based, to, based on what you know about how everything works. Right. But the much more boring and unfortunately much more effective way was the <laughs> test plan, which meant... Right. It was like a 60-page document, which would say, all right, first, you do, uh, you go into every level and run around on the collision of every single, you know, uh, uh. thing and make sure that there's no collision missing where you can fall through. Step two, trigger all the cutscenes and make sure that the character's facing the right direction afterwards. Three, like, it was just these incredibly tedious, just small things but without a plan, you know, uh, for making sure that they were there, like, for example, make sure every cutscene triggers, you know, mm. uh, you could end up with really, really problematic situations. So, yeah. So the test plan is, is often the bane of some poor tester's existence, usually the least senior tester. <laughs> <laughs> Although, uh, Mary, my wife, she loved test plan testing, and she didn't like ad hoc testing because she's some sort of crazy mutant. So, I don't know what the deal was. Fair enough, then. 
God, I, just, I love this view. Just so nice. It is really good, isn't it? The, uh, you know, the there's a cheat in this game called Trippy Contrails. What? <laughs> uh, one of the cheats that you unlock by getting skill points is called Trippy Contrails. And nobody knew what that meant, ever. Yeah, what does that? I, I, it, I recognize the name, but I didn't know what it was. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> On this level, and any level that has flying cars that leave little trails behind them, uh, you see, if you look at the, the flying cars that are going on in the distance... Yeah, the white lines. Yeah, uh, trippy contrails just makes them three times longer. <laughs> so what? <laughs> that's it. it! That's it, right? So, so everybody was like, what the hell does this even mean, trippy contrails? So, it was really funny, and it taught us a lot about, you know, secrets and communication. Like oh you... my god, I thought it was like some kind of derpy control system, like ratchet controls funny. Nope. It and it was... was it was like it was like a derpy way of saying controls, trippy controls, trippy contrails. Nope, it was contrails, yeah, the uh, <laughs> contrail meaning a trail that, that yeah. is left behind something. <laughs> I think it's maybe Absolutely this level, brilliant. Pokitaru, maybe one other level has it, I don't know. <laughs> um, I should probably uh, mention now, this is where people traditionally glitch through the game. So, if you have um, the uh, decoy glove, the decoy, oh, decoy glove, because uh, the holo guys was basically simply, if you have the holo guys, you talk to her, you enter the hoverboard races without the hoverboard, there's no race, you're just in there as the holo guys, you take it off, you move to the area where you use the, uh, the thing. Um, here, what you have to do is, it's so sp specific, you have to face here, <laughs> aim down, and basically fire free, and hopefully you clip into the, um, the, uh, pale, uh, wall, not the orange wall, the orange wall will glitch you into an area you can't, you can get out of, but it won't help you, you need to get into this bit, then you need to go around the wall of this room, Okay. um, and there is a wall that you, that you can see, but it's, you can walk through it, I think it's about here, there's just a black wall, but it it's uh There's no collision. Really an, yeah, no collision. And that killed me the first time. I was like, do I have to jump here? <laughs> no, you go through it, Teal. Um, and you end up about here-ish. And then you basically have to helipack jump down. And you'll land on... Um, I, but actually, it makes a lot of sense with what you were saying. I think it's um it's the, the collision wall for the bit where the water's chasing you. Um, yeah, look at look it, at the map real quick, because we can tell if we're right over that. Oh yeah, that's that. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that's yeah, that's where it is. Yeah. Um, down there. That so, would explain yeah, you, it. You yeah. have to... Uh, I can't really show it apart from with my mouse, but basically you end up around here-ish, um, I think. Yeah, you end up around here, um, and the... like, just above where the arrow is. Um, and you're on top of a building, and you have to be on a, the corner of it. There's some an antenna, and that's basically the giveaway. That that one bit is solid, the rest you will fall <laughs> through and end up in the other bit of the level. Then from there, you can get onto the hoverboard track. Um, I think it's roughly at the beginning. Um, you okay. cannot go backwards. You go backwards, it automatically starts the race. You go forwards on the track, the standard way, it doesn't, and you're fine. Don't okay. know why. Uh, but that's how that's how I did it, and that's how I left my console on for 20 hours with the circle <laughs> button seller tape down with 18 games stacked on top so it didn't move yeah the, uh, <laughs> that's that's in an insane way of doing it i mean the the downstairs one's a lot easier yeah the, that doesn't exist anymore though <laughs> the holo guys one uh that was that was i know easy. i know why that happens it's like i was saying uh the when you go into the holo guys you go into a special hero state and the hoverboard race is a different special hero state. So if if you did it in such a way that the game put you into the hoverboard race one frame before you went into the holo guys, then you would go into the hoverboard race and immediately switch hero states into the holo guys, which meant you weren't hoverboarding. Right, I see. So, uh, and then there's a volume, uh, like a, a, a cube usually, in front of the start of the hoverboard race. And what that does is as soon as you drop into that volume, it starts the race with all the other guys and everything. So uh, the way it's set up is there's physically in the world an invisible cube that you walk through. And that's why it starts, uh, that's why it starts the race because the way that the programmer who did this did it 
was you talk to the lady, you switch to the hoverboard hero state, you drop into that cube, and then the race logic starts. Right. So that it, it makes a lot of sense about why those two things would happen that way. I feel like I should um, quickly explain. Uh, basically, you need to have the taunter directly under these set of boxes, um, and the ones in the clear face, and then it will work. It will give you infinite bolts. They constantly respawn. They don't give you a lot of bolts. That's why it takes 20 hours to get to a million for that one for that one silver trophy. But yep. yeah. Well, the uh, uh, the reason that those crates respawn that way is, you notice how every time you do a lap, the crates come back. Yeah, for that. The way it was programmed was when you get a certain number of meters away from the crates, they would respawn. In that uh. one. In that one crate area you were pointing out. Yeah, you were underneath. And you're far enough away from the crates that they will respawn right. immediately. Right? Brilliant. Yeah, and, and it's the same thing when you're using the taunter from underneath the racetrack. The, you're far enough away from the crates that they're going to respawn mm. infinitely. So, right. yeah, that, that's why that happens. That's amazing, actually. Um, it's, it's pretty crazy how just these little tiny... Uh, uh, decisions that you don't think, you know, that you think, okay, this is the fastest way to solve the problem that I have right now, right? Mm. And that's usually what ends up causing these really interesting bugs that nobody finds, because it, it ends up being a cascade effect. There's a lot of things that go together. Yeah. So are we, are we done with this level? We are. That is this level done. Uh, before we go, is there any stories you want to... I mean, we can save them in the next part. Is there anything you want to talk about the Glover Doom or the Mind Glove? Because I don't intend to buy them because I don't like them much. Oh, really? And, what's and, what's wrong with the Mind Glove and the the Glover Doom? Uh, the Glover Doom is good, but I like it's it's good for attacking things far away when you're potentially being overpowered. But yeah. I don't really need it personally. Ah, uh, you're um, just and, you're just too great for that. Is that uh, it? <laughs> no, it's just I don't like using it. it slows me. Oh, down. okay. <laughs> Uh, same with the mind glove. Really, I've never really liked the mind glove. It's not nothing it's, bad about it. It's just it, they don't upgrade, so I don't feel a compulsion to buy it. Yeah, yeah. That that was that was really helpful in the second game. And the and the main purpose of the mind glove was to work with the taunter. Like you're supposed to throw mines oh. out and then taunt dudes to run into the mines, but nobody really got that. No, I yeah. didn't. That never occurred to me. So, uh, fair enough. Yeah. So uh, for Ratchet and Clank. Developer commentary. I'm Mike Stout. And I'm Teal. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.